um, hopefully it's uh, correct. And I'd like to start out by uh, reading the uh, required uh, information prior to our uh, session today. As chair of division two of the House Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This public meeting is pertaining to the Department of Education. Please note that there is no fiscal location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with Emergency Order 1, I confirm that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen. If necessary, participate in the meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been available, made available in the house calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice of this meeting complies with house rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should email LBA underscore fiscal at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. LBA staff are on the meeting assisting us. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states they're present, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the Right to Know Act. So, Representative Lynn, if you would call the roll, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Bucco. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm present. I'm at my home in Conway, and there's no one else in the house. All right. Uh, Representative Danielson, we know, is not here. Um, Representative Heath. Um, good morning. Uh, Mary Heath here in Manchester, and my husband is outside shoveling. <laughs> And I am Representative Bob Lynn. I'm present in my home in Wyndham, and my wife and son are in the house, but not in the room. Uh, Representative Murray. Good morning, Kate Murray here in Newcastle. I'm alone in the house, except for the dog. My husband is off for his co first COVID shot, and we'll be back shortly, so then he'll be back in the basement. <laughs> Representative Petrie. Oh, yeah. Joe, you need to unmute. Hey, I know. I just, I just, uh, I was doing some, uh, I had a phone call. It always happens right at the time you're supposed to have a meeting. Yeah. So I am here. We got a dog and a wife that's roaming around. Very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. And Representative Umberger. Yes, I, uh, I'm still in Kearsarge and uh, my husband is out shoveling and as soon as he finishes, he'll be back in the house wandering around. So I see that uh, Commissioner Etta Blue and uh, Tammy Valancourt are both with us. And so I'd like to um, welcome you to division two. I know you have been through this drill several times and we're, uh, we're happy to have you. Um, I would like to know uh, Commissioner, if you would prefer us to hold our questions until you finish your briefing, or if you would prefer that we ask questions as they occur. So I will defer to you and whatever you're most comfortable with, I'm happy to respond to questions at any point during the presentation. So really that's uh, representative, however you wanna run the meeting. Okay, well then what we'll do is as we're going through the various topics, we will, uh, 
raise our hand and uh, see what happens. Thank Maybe. you. If you would, please go ahead. So I have um, some slides that we had shared, and I don't know if we want to put those up on the screen or if everybody has those available to them, I can just walk through those. Uh, there are two documents that we shared with you. One is a PowerPoint presentation relative to the budget. And then um, I also prepared a summary of some of the federal funds that we have received and thought I would spend a little bit of time just giving you an overview of those federal funds that we have received uh, in response to COVID. So Mickey, I don't know if we want to share the screen or if I, does everybody have a copy of the presentation? If they do, I can just go ahead and start. Uh, I think it would be better if you shared the screen, Commissioner. You do have the capability, Commissioner, or if Tammy would like to share a screen, that way you can go to the next slide as you want to do it rather than me. Uh, okay, since I don't have the soft copy of the presentation that was sent over, I'm going to let Tammy share that, or Mickey, if you have it, that would be great. All right, hold on one sec while I go find it. <clears throat> I can you have it in the agenda, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, that's okay, Tammy. If you have it, then you can call it up. That would be great. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. So, Tammy, you can advance one slide when you're ready. Okay. So, just for the committee, and I, I see many familiar faces on here, which I know um, many of you understand the Department of Education, kind of understand how we are structured, how we're organized. Um, but this will kind of level set us in terms of some of the conversation. Um, we have under the office of the commissioner, we have a deputy commissioner, and then we have four divisions. Um, we have starting on my right is the division uh, of educator support and higher education. Um, and this is the division that is principally responsible for uh, activities around educator credentialing. Uh, we currently have about 27,000 educator credentials that we manage um, through a variety of uh, technology uh, platforms and stuff that we use. Of those 27,000 educator credentials that we manage, we actually have about, just so that nobody gets confused, about 14,500 credentialed educators working in our K-12 system. So all, sometimes there are people from out of state who hold credentials. There are many people who hold credentials that are not working in education, but just thought it was important to create that distinction for you. Another aspect of the Division of Educator Support in Higher Education is responsibility for management of our higher education oversight, which includes the Higher Education Commission, as well as the Council for Teacher Education, which are two governing bodies that we administer and participate in. Um, the Higher Education Commission has a role um, as a member of the Higher Education Commission, um, which is responsible for program approval for post-secondary institutions in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and then the Council for Teacher Education has oversight responsibility for our uh, rules that uh, govern our educator credentials. And so that is principally what is managed through that division. The next division that we have is the Division of Learner Supports. And the Division of Learner Supports is one of our larger divisions at the agency and is really focused on what sometimes I refer to as all things kids. Um, and so this includes a number of different programs. So including our title programs. So this would be Title I or Title II. Title III, Title IV-A, Title IV-B, our 21C programs that we've got going. Um, so they're managing all of those title programs. So a significant amount of financial impact relative to federal dollars that flow through that particular bureau. Uh, the next area that is also included in the Division of Learner Support is um, our Bureau of Special Education. And so this manages, again, federally funded IDEA funds principally. We have a couple of generally funded positions in there, but mostly it is federally funded. Um, and that is managing the special education activities here in the state of New Hampshire, supporting all of our special educators uh, across the state who are delivering services on a day, daily basis. Um, the next area that I will focus on for you in the Division of Learner Supports is the Bureau of Student Wellness. 
The Bureau of Student Wellness is dealing with a lot of different aspects relative to student mental and behavioral health in our school systems and how we might support those students um, with the belief that as we support students in their behavioral and mental health, we can get better educational outcomes for them. And we try to make that our kind of our focus as we work towards that. The next area that I will highlight for you. Excuse me, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, Representative Heath, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Commissioner. But it's very simple. Could you just differentiate between who's federally funded and who is um, general um, budget, please? I, I, I know you have so many that are federally funded and so few that are, are, are state funded. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you. No problem at all. So I'll try and distinguish. Although what I will tell you, Representative Heath, is that really a lot of times it's kind of a combination. So for example, if I go to my IDEA, it is principally federally funded, but of course we have to manage about a $30 million pool of state funds. Um, and we're not able to use federal funds to manage those state funds. So we do have two individuals in that bureau that are um, state funded to be able to help manage some of that, uh, that activity. Um, in the Bureau of Student Wellness, again, it's principally federally funded through grants from uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, but there are, I think there are some small amount of uh, general funds in there. And I could be wrong on that. And Tammy's welcome to jump in and correct me anytime I get something wrong in a budget presentation. Um, the next uh, you know, bureau in the Division of Learner Support that I think is important to bring to your attention is the, um, the Bureau of Adult Education. Um, and so this is, has a combination of both state and federal funds. Uh, Representative Heath, just to kind of highlight that for you, um, the state funding in the Bureau of uh, Adult Education is a critical component of matching what is often referred to as our MOE or our maintenance of effort. And so it's a really important thing. Sometimes there's a, a tendency to want to say like, well, if we could just reduce the state funds and let the, the federal funds carry that program, um, we have to bear in mind that oftentimes when we receive federal funds, it comes with strings. One of those strings oftentimes is that the state maintains a certain level of state participation in the programming um, so that we can uh, continue to receive those federal funds. Um, another aspect of uh, the Bureau of Adult Education that I think is important is the role that it plays in the life of high school students, principally you know, 16 and 17 and 18 year old students, but sometimes even uh, 15 year old students. Um, we attract a large number of students from our high schools who are what we refer to as duly enrolled. And so these are students who are enrolled in their local traditional high school, but they're taking their courses through the adult education program. Um, oftentimes they do that uh, because they're struggling in their traditional learning environment. Um, and sometimes the struggles is really just, and I met with a lot of these kids, the struggles are around uh, just the, the size of the school, or sometimes as the kids would describe it to me, the drama of high school, they, they don't do well with. Um, and they would much prefer to go to class at, you know, take a three o'clock class in the afternoon and a six o'clock class at night, you know, fits their schedule a little bit better. Maybe they've got to help take care of a parent at home in the day. And um, so they are taking kind of these night classes. They like the classes because they are then taking classes alongside other adults in the state. Um, those adults tend to be more mature and a little bit more focused because they're coming back for their education. And it's just an environment that many of, these, many of our students in that um, program find more conducive to their own success. Um, I only mention that because it is a fairly large number um, in the neighborhood of about 1400 students uh, in New Hampshire are uh, you know, through that program, I, I often tease, um, and now bear in mind that that's spread out all over the state, right? So that's not in one location. Uh, but I often tease, uh, you know, Sarah Wheeler, who is our bureau director or our bureau lead there, um, that she runs the largest high school in New Hampshire, which is obviously facetious because it's not, but she's doing a great job for those kiddos, and we're very happy about that. Uh, um, Commissioner, excuse me. Uh, is this what the Eagle Academy in Conway? falls under or is that a different area? 
So um, the Eagle Academy or in Conway would be one of the adult education programs that we are funding. I believe it is, yes. Okay, uh, and, thank and you. It, yeah, that would, that would be one of those alternative high school options. Um, and then we have some, just to represent so that you understand, so some of those alternative high schools are connected to an adult education program and some are not, right? So it's not universal that they're automatically connected. I know for example, in Manchester, they've got an alt high school that's not connected to uh, the, um, you know, the uh, adult education programming per se. Um, and then the last area in the Division of Learner Support that I wanted to highlight for you is um, the Bureau of Career and Technical Education. Uh, so this is the Bureau that has responsibility for all of our career and tech ed throughout the state, um, which is encompassed in about in 27, not about, but 27 career and technical education uh, centers that we have throughout the state. Um, and students are either in what's referred to as a sending location or a receiving location. So the receiving locations are these 27 sites that have um, special facilities are, that are designed to be able to provide and support the career and technical education. And then oftentimes you have sending schools, which are then sending their students into one of those receiving schools to be able, so those students can receive the career and technical education. Um, we just recently did some work around barriers to access to CTE, which I think is an important thing for me to just highlight for you. Um, and what you'll find is the way that we are architected in CTE if a student is in a receiving location, which means that their high school has career and technical education on site, there is a significantly higher probability that they will take a CTE class than if a student is in ascending high school and the student has to be sent to that CTE center. Um, probably the number one barrier that we face is uh, schedules and calendars. And what that means is just the dates and times and stuff like that. Um, so we are working hard to help at least those, uh, you know, regionally organized groups to try and coordinate those schedules and coordinate those calendars as much as possible to minimize the barriers to career and technical education. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense that, you know, if you're in, if you're in a receiving location and you have a 65% chance that you're going to take a CTE class, but if you're in a sending location, you have less than a 10% chance that you're going to take a class. And we know that you know probably the kids in both place, places want to access that type of um, of education. So that is our division of learner yes. support. We'll Commissioner, also... yep. excuse excuse me. Don't worry at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how many uh, children are actually being sent to the receiving high schools? Do we know? Um, I can get that information for you. We've got a little over nine thousand, maybe. About you know, it depends on with the COVID, a lot of numbers have been disrupted. Historically, we run about 9,500 students in our CTE programs. What I don't know off the top of my head is how many of those are coming from a sending location versus a receiving location, but we can get that information for you and provide that to the committee. I, I would appreciate that. Um, I assume that the, uh, whatever that, the CTE uh, committee commission uh, is continually working on that area? In terms of gaining access, we are continuing to try and find ways to get further access to students. I would say that that's our number one barrier to kids gaining access to CTE is uh, the sending receiving model that we have. And, and oftentimes, like, and, and a couple of years ago, the legislature did create a little bit more flexibility. Um, we used to have a prohibition that a a receiving center was not able to teach academic classes to the student, right? So if a student from a sending school had to get all their academics at their sending school and not at the receiving school, and that created barriers, the legislature did loosen that up and allowed mathematics classes to be taught at that receiving location. So now you have a student who's coming to CTE, and maybe the barrier was that the math class that they needed in their home school was being offered at the same time as the CTE programming. So then they said, well, you can't take CTE because you'll miss your math class. But if that receiving school also has a math class that doesn't conflict, why not let the kid just take the math class there while he's already at that building? Um, so just the more flexibility we have in terms of the programming, the easier it is, but it gets, it becomes more complicated because then everybody's looking at the dollars. And as you know, at the finance committee, the dollars always complicate things. So. 
Um, another aspect of the division of learner support that I just want to point out to you, well, actually, no, as long as we're on CTE, I'll just point out as well, CTE is funded primarily federally, um, to your point, sorry, Representative Heath, um, through the Perkins Grant. And uh, we do have a, um, some, a smaller amount of uh, state funding in the CTE operationally. Um, that we spend there. And again, it comes with a MOE maintenance of effort requirement with the feds. And I will point out that Perkins is a particularly onerous grant with respect to MOE. In other words, like every year, if you spend, if I spend, I don't meet my maintenance of effort by $1, it's like an all or nothing, right? So if I fail my MOE, I will lose my $8 million of uh, Perkins funding that I might receive otherwise. Um, and then the other thing that I'll point out about the Division of Learner Support. So uh, we have been without a, uh, a division director, but we just at the last governor council meeting, uh, a new division director, we finally found somebody and we've nominated a new division director uh, that will be coming in and that will be really beneficial for uh, that uh, division, as well as for me, who is doing double duty as also the division director for the Division of Learner Support, which is a big uh, division. So we're excited to have another person on board and joining us. Uh, the next area that I will point you to is the Division of Educator, Education Analytics and Resources. Um, and this is run by a woman who many of you know, probably on the phone here, but uh, Caitlin Davis is the division director for this division. Yeah, everybody's getting a th thumbs up for Caitlin. Um, and um, what I will tell you is in there, they're focused principally on all of our data our reporting and our compliance. Um, those are the activities that they are principally focused on. And what I would encourage each of you to do if you've not been to the Department of Education's website, if you go there and then you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a link to something called iPlatform. And the iPlatform is a data system that the department has. Uh, we have tons of information, tons of data. And through uh, I report and I explore, uh, you can access almost everything that you'd ever want to know about education. Um, you know, we receive frequent right to know requests um, and it is nice to have iPlatform. We launched that platform, I think about two and a half, maybe three years ago. And now we basically just point people to our website because they can get almost every piece of information that they may have been looking for previously. Um, and, but it's, it's fun to explore. You've got lots of information. Um, it's easy to navigate using modern technology, and you'll be able to work through that. The other two important aspects of, of that division that I want to kind of, in addition to the data that I want to focus in on, is really some of the compliance and the monitoring. Um, we have two different types of uh, monitoring that take place in there. One is our fiscal monitoring. Uh, there's a gentleman, Tim Carney, who runs that. Um, and we've been doing that now for a couple of years. And this is making sure that our federal grant recipients and our uh, you know, schools who are the re main recipients of that are complying with the federal regulations around those grants that they receive. So we do actual monitoring for the school. Uh, we produce reports. Um, I think they're included on the website now. If not, they're gonna be included relatively shortly. We're just trying to again, push, push more and more stuff out there. Um, and then there's another compliance and accountability uh, area that I think is important to point out, and that is uh, through Nate Green and his uh, bureau in that division, which is really around school accountability. And it's like, how are the schools doing in terms of their performance uh, in meeting the minimum standards that we have for education? Um, that is a new activity at the agency. Um, and in fact, it's just in its design stage. We didn't previously have funding for that and that was disrupted for some amount of time, but we finally put that together so that we can now um, be able to do our monitoring for the schools and their compliance with the minimum standards for education. And so we're excited about that. And then the last division uh, that I will um, make note of is the Division of Workforce and Innovation. So this is a division. Um, we do not have a division director. I don't think that there has been a division director in this division for at least 10 years. Um, and it, um, so it runs, you know, kind of just as two bureaus really. Um, and those two bureaus are, and, and it runs under the office of the deputy commissioner. 
Um, but those two bureaus include uh, vocational rehabilitation. Um, as many of you know, we run the vocational rehabilitation for the state, uh, serving our uh, individuals ages 14 through, uh, through whatever age they reach um, who have disabilities to help them uh, secure employment. Uh, and that is uh, one of the activities that we have there. And then the other activity that we have, and you'll see this in our budget request this year relative to positions, is we run the Social Security Disability Administration. So we basically are, the, the federal government, the federal Social Security Administration outsources to states responsibility for adjudication of disability determination and appeals process around disability determinations. Um, and so we have an organization uh, that does nothing but that work right now. And, uh, and that is uh, part of this division of workforce and innovation. So um, that's pretty much an overview of the agency. And while those are kind of the functional things, I, Tammy, I don't know who did this uh, you know, organization chart, but where are you? Uh, but then we also have our uh, Office of Business Management, OMB, Office of OBM, or yeah, OBM, Office of Business Management, um, which is run and headed up by Tammy Valancourt, who is on the call and is our Chief Financial Officer. Um, and Tammy has an organization that is responsible for all of the budgetary, the finance, and really kind of uh, finance intellect, 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 what am I saying here? Business analytics, sorry. Um, relative to uh, a lot of the, the work that we do here at the department. Um, and so she is also there. It also houses our human resources function. And then as you know, one of the other things that you don't see on here that you might typically see is we don't have an information technology department because that is run by DOIT. And so that's the department. And I will pause there. I realize that I've given you kind of a, of a big overview there, but let me pause and just see if there's any questions for some of the members who maybe were not as familiar with the agency. Uh, Representative Heath, you had a question? Yes, please. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, Voc Rehab had a lot of issues during the last budget cycle, and I know that there's been an audit. I haven't read it all yet, but could you just speak to, has that all been cleaned up and, and there's not a problem anymore? So what you're referring to is, um, in December of 17, we put in some financial controls and we discovered that the Bureau was overspending um, and we ended up in an order of selection. So we have moved out of the order of selection. Uh, Representative Chief, I would not say that we're out of the woods. There are a number of internal control deficiencies that need to be corrected over there. And quite frankly, it's outside of the sweet spot of a lot of the people there. So it is not an easy task for them to make some of the changes that need to be made. Uh, but we did just have that audit report. It pointed out a number of areas that need to be corrected. And we are in the process of now, we were correcting them before and we're continuing to correct those deficiencies. Um, so worth keeping an eye on. Thank you, Commissioner. And I just want to say, um, I'm very pleased to see how well automated you have created so many of those areas that were long overdue in getting um, into a digital form. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Representative Lynn, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I'm, I was, um, I uh, have to say, I was, I was surprised when I heard you say that um, DOE is, is uh, I guess the right word would be a delegatee from the Social Security Administration to make disability determinations. And I guess my question is, um, do you do that generally even for, you know, like in other words, if suppose there's a 55 year old man or woman who, who is claiming uh, that they're disabled, do you do those determinations for them or is it only of certain people of a younger age? That's my first question. And my second question is, does the, does the Federal Social Security Administration reimburse the state for your services? Yes, so uh, I'll, I'll go in reverse order. So yes, they it's fully, that, and I didn't answer that question. Sorry about Rafiq, I didn't answer that. That is 100% federally funded. Uh, there are no general funds in there. Uh, so basically they pay us for all of the costs and it's pure pass-through associated with that, including you know, our, our uh, overhead rate that we, what we pass through there as well. 
Um, and the work that we do, so bear in mind that the uh, Social Security Administration itself has Social Security offices, they're meeting with clients. So ours is really a behind the scenes activity where we have an office of people who are receiving medical records and files and really making adjudications principally on appeals. So somebody gets a determination from the Social Security Administration that says, you don't qualify, they appeal that. That might get referred to our team. Uh, I think we have you know, a number of doctors on contract that we work with uh, that are looking at those and just making determinations. So we are really just a back office operation for the Social Security Administration. Why it's located in the Department of Education, I'm not sure when I first arrived here, I do have the same kind of curious question, like how does that have to do with education? Um, and you know, apparently this is an arrangement that you know dates back at the federal level for some amount of time through the DOE, and that's why it's here, I guess. Thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to go to my yeah. next slide. Excuse me, just a second. Are there are there any other questions from uh, anyone on the uh, organization and um, what each of the uh, various divisions do? Okay, seeing none, go ahead, Commissioner. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide. And this is, um, you know, I don't know how all of the other agencies necessarily put together the budgets. I know you guys all have your budget books, but this um, document I think is helpful because it puts it all in one place and just makes it really easy to kind of understand and see Kind of what's happening on an annual basis relative to um, you know education the funds that are coming in and the funds that are going out so that you get to see it i have it organized first through, through uh, general funds and then you'll see past which includes you know our general fund state aid our general funds pass through and the general fund salary and then we have the education trust fund as well that you'll see there um, and then what you'll see is, and I don't know if I'm able to circle this, uh, you have the revenue at the top. So we are funded through general funds. Um, and these are the general funds that really focus on what we spend at the department level in order to support services. And I'll describe each of those in detail for you. The next thing you see is the federal funding that we have to support education, uh, about 223 million, 255 million. There are some additional funds this year that you will see coming in and I'll explain those separately. Uh, you then have the education trust fund, which is contributing as well as some other funds, which could be uh, whether that's credentialing funds or other types of fees that will come in. Um, and those are the revenues that we receive. And then, the, and then you'll see there's another line item there. We don't have it for 21 because it's not been put in, but it's just the local education spending. But again, just trying to give you kind of a big picture perspective of what does it look like? And this is almost a PL for education in New Hampshire. And hopefully you have this document. Um, and then I've also just included for everyone some basic enrollment information and the state per pupil cost, um, you know, which is a computed number based on a formula. And then what you'll see on the next line down, if you see total general funds. Um, you know, so our budget last year was 25 and 27. There's a specific project in that jump in there that you'll see coming out this time. And then the, in the governor's recommended budget is 23,452, um, which represents the target that the governor gave us to be able to uh, manage the budget. So uh, the way, for those of you new in, in the process, uh, we receive a budget target from the governor, and then we try to put together a budget based on what that target is and how we might deliver on that budget. And so just walking through some of the programs that we have and highlighting a couple of things, um, you know, the first one I think you'll see is, so here's our, our state aid general, and you'll see the different components that make this up. But um, the, the things I kind of wanted to point out here is you'll see uh, we had a dropout prevention program that was started a number of years ago under Governor Lynch. Um, and it was grants that were made to districts to uh, respond to what at the time about 10 or 12 years ago uh, was some relatively significant dropout issues in our school system. 
Um, I think, uh, you know, as we were going through and trying to prioritize our budget and looking at the various programs in terms of what, uh, you know, we, you know, where we were with those programs and what might go forward, um, New Hampshire uh, has, has significantly addressed its dropout prevention in the state. We are one of the top states in terms of graduation rates for our students. We have done things both at the legislature as well as the local school district and at the department to minimize the effect of dropout programs. You know, some of which is not the least of which is, you know, our adult education programs that we talked about earlier in terms of the organization to try and create pathways for these students so that they don't drop out. We find an educational pathway that they can plug into and we can get them through and across the goal line of a high school diploma. So as we prioritize, so this is one of the items that came out of our budget and that's what I'm pointing that out to you here. And again, so it's been about, around for about 10 years. One might argue that it has done its job in terms of improvements relative to the performance there. Um, some of the other, these are some relatively minor things that we took out, but in our career and technical student organization, so in our different programs, whether that's the automotive program or the agriculture program or the, uh, the machining program, uh, we've got different clubs and sports. They're kind of like sports, but they're little clubs that kids organize around for their different CTE programming. Um, and we have always provided support to those and we will continue to provide support, uh, but we may not get to have pepperoni on the pizza this year um, if, if we have to reduce the spending and those. So that's one area that we've looked at. Um, you know, excuse me, excuse yeah. me, Commissioner. If I'm looking at this correctly, uh, you did not fund tuition and transportation. Is that the CTE program or is that something else? So let me clarify for you that. So what you're pointing out is, and I guess you can't see my screen, but the two lines above that, the 7.4 million and the 33 million that had, had a mount in 2019, in fiscal 19. And Tammy, if you have your mouse and you can circle the numbers as I'm talking about them, that might help everybody. So in 2019, we had, um, you'll see the 33 million building aid, and then you had tuition and transportation for 7.4 million. Those items in the last budget were moved out of the operating budget and into the education trust fund. So that's why you see nothing after that. It doesn't mean that we haven't done building aid. It's just that they changed the, the legislature last time changed the accounting for those and moved them down below. So you're going to see those then down below. Okay, thank you. I didn't realize that. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, so they came to the trust fund. Some other areas that I just want to highlight then in terms of programming as well as we were working to manage this is that the national the New Hampshire Scholars Program, which we had funded in our last budget cycle is not funded in this budget cycle. The dual and concurrent is, which was funded in the last budget cycle is not funded. And I'm gonna pause for a minute. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then also the robotics that we funded in the last budget cycle didn't fund in this budget cycle. And I think it's important to bear in mind that some of these, so for example, the, the, with the pandemic, we didn't spend much of that uh, second year of uh, robotics anyways, um, much of the programming there was disrupted. Um, in the budgeting process, uh, relative to the dual and concurrent, so the way that this program works is, this is dual and concurrent fees that are paid for students who are taking classes in their high school. And then if those students wanna receive a community college credit for it, um, then, the, the student can apply for and get college credit and the Department of Education will pay 200 up to, well, I think a minimum of $250 to the community college so that those students will receive credit. So a couple of aspects of this program in the budget process that I think are important to consider. One is um, it didn't really make sense for me to be the processor of those funds. Uh, in effect, these are students who are or taking and earning college credit. So there was not really a need for me to administer because essentially what was happening is I would get a bill from the community college and I would send them the money. And so we're like, well, why would you send us the money? Like to, for me to send it to them, why not just fund it directly to the community college to offer that? Again, an administrative efficiency in that process. 
And then the second aspect of this that I think is important to consider is, you know, what is, you know, the, the community college is already is offering these, these courses, but just to describe, so we have the running start courses. So a running start course is taught at the high school by a high school teacher. And so essentially you have one of my high school classes is taking place. I got a high school teacher who's going to teach the class whether or not running start takes place. And they're teaching the kids who are there. It's only if the kid wants, if the student wants to claim credit for that, that the community college gets involved. And their involvement, and I may be understanding this, so you may want to check with their, them as well as they have a perspective on this. Um, but they're assuring that the teacher, my high school teacher who's teaching the class, has the credential, generally a terminal degree in that subject, to be a terminal master's degree in that subject, to be able to teach it for college credit. So for example, if I'm teaching a math class and the teacher there has a bachelor's degree in mathematics the, and they're teaching that math class, they're not eligible to to earn high school credit in that class because that teacher isn't qualified at the collegiate level, at the post-secondary level to teach that class. If that teacher, however, has a terminal, a master's degree in mathematics, then they are eligible to teach the class both for high school as well as for college credit. And therefore it enables those students to both earn high school credit and college credit on a go forward basis. Um, and so the question becomes when the, when the community college is awarding those credits, you know, what is the cost of awarding those credits to the college? So something that we can look carefully at as we're working with a skinny down budget here. Um, and then the other program that the community college offers is the dual, uh, which is basically allows students in high school to take classes at the community college. So those students are going to community college and getting those. And so they are also reimbursed through this program for those students. And so, again, um, you know, the, the thinking is that this is probably more of a community college program than it is a Department of Education program, since really we are simply the conduit. I receive the money from the legislature, and then when I get an invoice from the, um, the, uh, the community college, I send the money over to them. It might be easier to just fund directly to the community college. Uh, I will tell you that there is a problem in fiscal 21 relative to this, in that uh, the community college has used up all of the funding. So this funding has been 100% basically exhausted in this budget cycle. And so we don't have appropriation, and I don't know that they do have appropriation. Um, so it's something that we can work through in terms of deciding how we want to manage this program on a go-forward basis, because we certainly want to make sure that our students have the opportunity to earn those uh, you know, post-secondary credits through that high school experience. And I think that there's some ways to do that. Um, I see a number of hands going up, so I'm going to yep. just pause yep. and because that's yep. a great conversation. I get it. Okay. Representative Bucco, uh, you had a question? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for presenting today. And, and uh, thank you to uh, Tammy and Caitlin for supporting this call. Um, you, when, when you were talking about... Um, transportation, you mentioned that it had been transferred into uh, the education trust fund. And in, in the budget, the education trust fund on page uh, 1293 is itemized as building aid, adequate education aid, tuition and transportation aid, charter school tuition and special education aid. And then on the next page, that's all, uh, that's all bundled onto other. So uh, I, which one of those things are new and is that that other is is itemized all those things are now in the education trust fund right so representative what i'll do is i'll, I'll stick with this spreadsheet and then i'll have Tammy get the actual reference on the page but if you look further down and maybe i should have just done this if you take the 20 column if you go down towards the bottom of the page you'll see we have the category called education trust fund and then yeah, we enumerate you. all of the items there and so what you'll see is that if you look at building aid, for example, at that 38 million 500,000, right? So there yes. was nothing last year, but now you have the 38,000, 38 million 500,000 in there. If you look at the line under tuition and transportation, you had zero in fiscal year 19, and you have 9 million in fiscal 20, 9 million in 21, 9 million in 22, and 9 million in 23. 
So that is where those funds have been transferred to. If that, I don't know if that helps everybody to see how we just yeah. took them out of those two line items up above and we moved them down below. Yes, uh, thank you. I didn't see that earlier. Thank you. No problem. Representative. Um, okay. Were you finished, Tom? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Representative Heath. That, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did, I remember clearly, we did that last year because um, we had an excess in the trust and it just seemed more appropriate for those funds to be there. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I am really upset about dual enrollment. That's 7,000 students in New Hampshire that participate in the dual enrollment program. Um, that's something that I hope this committee will think about. Um, adding back in. Um, Commissioner, would you be adverse to that? No, I don't have any problem supporting it. The two things that I would tell you is, it's probably more efficient if we just fund the activity at the community college, right? And, uh, and then instead of paying maybe a fee, because if you think about it, I, I think what we have to think about this, Representative Heath, is like, so what is the correlation between $250 a student and a kid getting the college credit, really what we have to figure out, what does it cost the community college to administer a program to qualify the high school teacher so that they're eligible to teach? You know, what is the incremental cost to the community college when you stick an extra kid in the class, right? If they got, you know, 18 kids in the class and then a high school kid shows up makes it 19, is it $250 or what is it? So it just seems to me that the appropriate place to, to make sure that we create these seamless systems for those kids might be better at the community college. Th thank you, Commissioner. My other question is about the state scholar program. Yeah. For years, we've really encouraged people, um, our, our high school juniors and seniors to look at taking those really rigorous courses and, and to be um, noted for their achievement in them. Um, can you just talk to me about why that disappeared? Yeah, and, well, and so you know as well that I have been an advocate for the New Hampshire Scholar since I got here. I love setting a high bar for kids and letting them get there. Um, I didn't get it, I think, in the last budget cycle. I got funding for it in this budget cycle. And as you know, Scott Powers was administering that for us. Um, that got disrupted during the pandemic. Um, you know, but in terms of, so it is a program that is fairly mature, has good governance in the sense that it has a good board of directors that's overseeing it. And so maybe a little bit not like the dropout prevention program that has done its work. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the New Hampshire scholars, it feels like it's in, relative to all of the various programming that we have, I'm like they feel like they're in a pretty good place, right? Like we've got, we got now like over 5,000 kids a year who are doing this. The schools understand it. Almost all of our schools are participating in it. Um, so I think that, you know, you try to figure out where can you have the least disruption, right? And so that's really a value that we were trying to, to make. And yeah, like, so Representative Heath, just like me, you can look down this line of columns, right? We say like, okay, how do I get to this number? And if I take, if I put a hundred thousand back in here, where do I want to take it out of? You know what I'm saying? So that's Thank really you, what we're doing. Um, yeah. Just one uh, quick final question. Um, do you have just off the top of your head, a total number of general funded positions in the DOE? I do. In fact, let's just do that. I have that on my. I don't have. It's coming up on a slide, or I'll have it. I have it even on here or something. Okay. We can absolutely get that for you. Later, we can do that. Thank you. Yeah. So actually, can we go to? Oh, and actually, the only other point line I'm going to point out is, so we do have fiscal year 20. I had a four million dollar and four four million one hundred twenty four and twenty one, um, and then you'll see. Actually, no, it's the four million. It goes from, in 2021, it's DOIT, rent, phone, and other. I go from 2.5 million to 4.7 million. And then I'm down a significant amount. And this is our student information system that we just couldn't sustain in the budget. And so with that, I'm gonna just turn slide and talk a little bit about the student information system. So uh, this is- Commissioner, yep. Commissioner, before you do that, I have a follow-up on the scholars program. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so you are not eliminating the scholars program, but rather what you're doing is 
uh, the, the program will continue. It's just that there won't be anything at the at DOE to support it. Is that correct? So exactly. So we have a we work with the NHCUC. We had a contract with them to administer the program. And so we are not able to support an administrator for that program through the NHCUC anymore. But the program itself exists. There is a board of directors. They are continuing to run it. The question is, should that now spin off and perhaps you know, among the, the hundreds of schools that are participating in that, maybe if everybody were to kick in a few dollars, they could support the administration of that program, which we know is benefiting students. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so let me jump on and I don't I don't want to go over my time because I know you have other hearings too. So uh, the statewide information system is something that I have been advocating for for four years. I'm going to keep advocating for it. Uh, this is really a system that allows us to a, a couple of different things. Improve efficiency. We are literally spending across the state, whether it's at the department or in the school districts, man months maybe man years of time trying to input data into various Excel spreadsheets and various systems that don't talk to one another. We're exporting information out of one into another system. And it's just, it's an incredibly inefficient way to do it. The second aspect is that it makes it difficult. Oftentimes I get requests for information from the legislature. Can you let me know about this or let me know about that? And we simply don't have a statewide information system that allows us to look across those students and get the information that you want to know. And so oftentimes we are reduced to, you know, surveys to the districts, which again is more manual, man, man months of time, people trying to collect information again for ad hoc reports and stuff like that. And then the third is that we have a data security risk in our state because of some of the disparity we have relative to the various systems across the state that we would be able to uh, improve our data privacy, data security through a statewide information system. And just to be clear, this does not mean that the state is running the data systems for all of the districts, as much as it means the state has a overlay system that allows us to gain access to the information that we need. You know, the school can shut off and keep the information that they need, but I get to get the information that I need. So it just improves the efficiency across the state in terms of uh, student information and reporting. Um, and so that this is one of our prioritized needs that did not make it into the budget, but I will continue to advocate for if you find that you have room. And then um, I just want, I'm going to flip over to the next slide. Uh, excuse me. Oh, okay, uh, the questions on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Representative yeah. Heath has a question. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, for the statewide student information system data warehouse, um, in the past, that information was uploaded from school districts. Now, are you saying that you'll have the capacity to go in and take the data that you need at the local school district level? Yeah, so what we'll actually be able to do is that all of those, man, those uploads happen manually. Oftentimes what's happening is the school district is exporting a CBS file or an Excel type of a file from their local system and then uploading that to my system, and then I import that into my data warehouse. What this will do is allow us to have an automated link. So the reports that need to come automatically are exported from their system to my system, as opposed to going through that multi-step risk of error type of a process. Now, is that a, a security issue? I remember my good friend, Neil Kirk, and he might be concerned about this. So actually, Neil Kirk would be happy about this because what it will do is it will minimize the security risk because what we can do is we can create an actual secure transfer of that data as opposed to now what you've got is kind of these open files of a CVS file or an Excel file that is then being uploaded. So all of those different transactions from one system to another, to another, to another, every one of those creates a vulnerability for that data. Whereas in a, with a, a, some type of a student information system, we'd be able to minimize that and eliminate that risk. And one more question, Commissioner. Um, SASID has been the means by which you get that information. Um, will you continue with the SASID? You don't go to a student's name or address or any of that information, do you? 
Now, all of that same data architecture stays the same. All we do is we eliminate all of these risky manual processes is what we're trying to do. But the SAS, it still remains the primary key indicator for the students. And so I don't have any additional information, right? Like the information I'm getting today is the same information I get in, this, in a student information system, but I get it through an automated process, not a manual process. So the school district, Madam Chair, if I could ask one more question, please. No problem. Um, so the student information is um, secure at the school district level, and you are only having access to certain things that you have received in the past. Correct. So the school district will define like, okay, here's all the information that's ours. Here's the three pieces of information that belong to the Department of Education. So we will build a technology bridge so that I get to get that information, but not the other stuff. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we're going to have to have a, a little longer discussion on this area okay. um, because um, I know that the uh, school systems have spent a lot of money on uh, automating all of this information. And I guess we just need to understand how you are going to uh, interact with the uh, the various um, databases that the uh, that the schools are currently using because it is not uniform across the state. I think as we probably all know. Yep, and then uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're looking for a system that is an overlay. So I don't care what system the school has, but I have the ability to do kind of API bridges to be able to connect to that data and pull up the information that we need. So, Representative Lynn, you had a question. Uh, no, no, thank you, Madam Chair, but the, the commissioner answered it in response to uh, uh, Representative Heath's question. Thank you. So, Timmy, jump to the next slide, and I'm going to do uh, three minutes left, and I, and I can run over if, if the committee can. But if I can't, okay, so here is, these are our positions. We currently have 287 positions. Timmy, can you jump in and tell me how many of those are generally funded? I'm going to guess it's about 50 or 53. I don't think I have that on my slide right. here. How many? 63. 63, okay. So 63 of those are generally funded. We are requesting seven new positions. Uh, two of those will be, but they're all federally funded. Two of those are the charter school grant that you, uh, that I've received and they are paid for through that charter school grant. And then we're doing such a great job for the social security Dis uh, disability administration that they are asking us to do more work and want to fund an additional five positions in that bureau. And then I have one other. Uh, uh, just, just, uh, just a moment, please. Yep. So these positions are in fact already in the budget? Correct. Okay. And out of that, the seven are all federally funded. So it's not nothing that will have an effect on um, the general fund budget. That's correct. Uh, Representative Bucco, I see that you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have a question on the uh, charter school grant. Um, I thought it was only it was going to be ten million this year, but in the budget, I see where um, charter school federal grants are, are posted at twenty seven million. So it would be it's ten year ten million for this fiscal year that we're in right now. But then your budget is going to again looking forward to my twenty two twenty three. And so it would be 27 million during that period of time. It would be, say that again, please, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the, the total grant is 46 million. Yes, I understand. I've gotten 10 of it. I'm gonna add in this next budget cycle, 22.3, 27 million. And then in the, when I get to my 24, 25 budget, I'll probably adding another 10. Um, well, the 27 million was what I was questioning. I thought that would be 10 for next year. Nope, so it's 10 this year, it's 27 million, because basically I get to move forward with that 46 million. So I'm gonna move forward in that next biennium budget with 27, because over that full period, I have to spend all 5 million. So the initial tranche that they gave me was 10, then I think I have you know, a, a 12 and a 15 tranches, the next tranches that I get from the uh, the feds relative to that grant. 
So we're just budgeting what the grant, what the federal grant awards to us is what we have budgeted. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I have a follow up on that. Okay. Are you are you able to spend are you able to um, spend that federal grant to uh, improve existing schools? So existing schools are eligible to apply for those grants because existing schools are eligible to become charter schools or they can start a charter school. And we have a number of districts who are looking at kind of alternative academies or some type of thing that they want to do. And so they absolutely are able to apply for that. Would, would that be um, charter schools, charter public schools that are already existing? So existing charter public schools may also apply for those grants as an expansion grant or a replication grant. Oh, thank you. Representative Lynn, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, my only question was re with regard to the new positions that you indicated, um, all seven would be federally funded. I, I guess my only question is, is this, I know that it, it sometimes federal programs say, okay, we're gonna fund these, we're gonna fund something for a few years. And then after a few years, the state's on its own. And I'm just wondering, is this that kind of federal funding? So I don't think so. So the two that you have there, so the charter school grant, we know that's a discrete grant. And so they've not made a long-term commitment other than the $46 million grant that I have. We know that it runs a fixed period of time. And at the end of that grant, these two positions will go away because I don't have that grant funding to pay them. Uh, relative to the disability determination, they have, this is the second time since I've been here that they've expanded our mission in terms of the scope of work that we're providing to them. Um, if they were to cut back and say like, okay, we're gonna give you less funding, then we would have to uh, do a layoff in that bureau and reduce the number of, uh, of employees that we have in there because we can only hire what we have federal funds to pay for. Can I, may I have a follow-up question, uh, Madam Chair? Go ahead, sir. And so I guess my um, my only question on that is when when you have this kind of situation where let's say let's take it with the for the charter schools you have a grant from the from the feds for a certain period of time, um, do, are when the people are hired to fill those positions are. Are they, do they become sort of regular state employees or are they told, look, you're, you know, you're, we're hiring you, but you're only going to work for three years or four years. And then this grant is going to be over and, you know, there's, um, your job is going to be eliminated. Yeah. So it's actually kind of a both and. So when we hire them, we tell them that they are what's referred to as grant funded. Um, and so they know that they are only funded to the extent that the grant will continue and that they have that. Uh, it's a both and in the sense that if they remain in state employee, and Tammy might have to correct me on this a little bit, but if they remain in state employee for longer than a year, they are part of the collective bargaining unit. And therefore, if the grant funds run out, I can't pay you for that position, but you now are a state employee that is subject to, you know, the bumping rights and everything else in terms of where else you might fit. So it's kind of a both and there. But Thank I you very much. It. Once my grant funds are out, I'm done. Thank you. Representative Heath, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, Representative Murray was before me, though. So why don't we let um, uh, Representative Murray go first, and then I'll go. OK, Representative Murray, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. I thought Mary was first, but I'm happy to go. Thank you both. Um, can you speak uh, more broadly around the um, charter school grants beyond the um, employee positions. What happens to the charter schools when the grants go away? Um, when the grant goes away, does that impact, a, will that create a financial burden on, um, on, this, on the state? Right, so this grant is what's referred to as an innovation and startup grant. So the only eligible expenses are for startup of the charter school, not for the operations of the charter school. So from day one, when a student is enrolled in the charter school, out of your education trust fund, we will pay state adequacy for those students. So this is designed around the startup. Um, I can tell you that if you go to the department's website, there is a quite extensive 
uh, white paper on the long-term financial implications of this, and it does not create a long-term burden to the state of New Hampshire. Representative Heath. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is with regard to the um, adequacy funding for charter schools. And have you taken into account and built in those number projections into the amount of uh, dollars that you are asking for in those lines? Do you feel that you've adequately covered it? Uh, we believe we have. We tried to do estimates in terms of what we think the students will be in all of the different categories. So we do think that we've adequately covered it. And in terms of um, um, charter school estimate numbers for new charter schools, what do you anticipate in the next two years? So I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can get that information and get it back to you. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this slide? So I would like to then just turn quickly, and again, I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome. Um, uh, Commissioner, you are welcome to stay as long as, uh, as long as we're keeping you here. How's that? Okay. Well, so then, uh, so Timmy, can you put up the federal COVID response funds? Yeah. So this is something I just wanted to put on, on your radar because there's a lot of questions around this. Um, and these are the federal COVID response funds that we have received this year so far. Um, and well, it's actually kind of a little bit of last year and this year uh, that I just wanted to kind of lay out for you so you get to see what that looks like. So, so far this year um, for K-12, we received about $305 million of additional funds. Um, I will tell you that there is another uh, relief, two other relief packages that are being negotiated. Um, one is the, the current, in the current administration, there's another uh, K-12 relief package that would provide more funds uh, to the schools as well. We don't have that yet, but I just put that out there so it's not included in here. So the first tranche that we received was ESSER-1, it was $37 million. Uh, most of this money um, is what's referred to as pass-through money. So we receive it and then we pass through our grant management system to the schools to be able to deploy. It's eligible for a lot of different um, you know, activities as we've described in here. So those ESSER-1 grants were made available to the schools last May. Um, so far this year, we've used about $6 million of those, uh, of those funds. So the schools are continuing to work through those funds. Um, and then if you just roll up a little bit, Tammy, the next tranche that we received was ESSER-2. Um, ESSER-2 received about $156 million. And this was able to be used almost identically as ESSER-1 in terms of uh, you know, helping the schools to basically respond to uh, the COVID. Um, they did add a couple of things. They emphasized in the, the grant um, award notification uh, an emphasis on student learning loss school facility repairs that would help relative to viral transmission, including you know, air quality systems and stuff like that in the schools. The schools are, this is an eligible use for these funds. And then there's a catch-all at the end of this in terms of eligibility that says other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation. So a fairly broad uh, you know, category of expenses, but um, those funds we've uh, allocated out to the district at this point in time, preliminary allocation, We've not yet set those up in the grant management systems. We're continuing to work on that. We needed to do some programming around that. Um, but I will tell you that, again, we've only used uh, six of the 37 that has been allocated. So uh, we don't think that there's schools that are out of funds at this point in time, um, you know, that are, that are somehow un they're unable to access funding that they need on a more urgent basis. Um, the other category is we've got the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Which is fund excuse, excuse me, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Okay. The, um, the uh, 37 million, <clears throat> you said that only six of that has been used? Uh, so far, they've only drawn down, drawn down six million of it. And how did the schools apply for that or did you send it out? They, Yep, so the way that it works is, so we did allocations to the schools, um, and then we, in our grant management system, we set up a budgeting template. All of the schools at this point in time have completed a budget, 
for um, their, the use of their funds. Um, and then they are continuing to work through that. And then what happens is they spend money on an activity, they report that activity as complete, we validate that it's eligible, and then they are funded, uh, they're back funded through an ACH transaction through Treasury. So the school spends the money first and then they get reimbursed. Correct, these are all reimbursement grants. Okay. And what you'll find is that throughout the Department of Education, almost everything we do is a reimbursement grant. Which Mary's shaking her head, that's a good thing, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have a list uh, for what the schools were um, authorized and which ones have not, or oh, which one? Which ones are not spending the money because I I hear I hear all the time that we're not doing enough and I just want to try to solve whatever that is. Okay, I mean I can share with you the information. Here's the grant allocation by school and here's the amount that they've drawn down. Uh, but bear in mind that all of the schools have budgeted their funds, so it may be if they haven't drawn it down that they have some plans for it in June or something like that, right? I do know, for example, um, you know, Representative Heath is here in Manchester. I had a conversation. They purchased a lot of technology, and they were waiting for the technology order to come in. Um, and so until that came in, like it would be kind of a step. And I don't know, if, Representative Heath, if you know if that came in yet or not. But they, for a long period of time, they hadn't drawn anything down, and we were waiting for this bill from the tech company. I don't know, Commissioner, but um, I will check on that because that was a concern of mine as well. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, they've all planned to do something with it. Like nobody's not budgeted it towards something. I would, yeah, I would still like I to still see- get that information. Yep. I all right, that. thank you. Uh, Representative Murray, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, following along that, when you provided that information, would it also be possible to provide examples of what some of these programs or projects are that the schools are doing? Sure, although in this vernacular, I mean, these are the types of things that they're eligible. Is that helpful? Uh, yes, um, I mean, I, I can read that. I'm just curious uh, more specifically within this broader paradigm of what's available, what schools are actually doing. So I would tell you, and I'm happy to, to give you any grant that you want, but if you look at this list, this pretty much enumerates it. What you're gonna find is there's gonna be a lot of invoices for masks and cleaning supplies. You're gonna find uh, you know, purchases of technology. You know, In Manchester, they made a significant investment in technology, and I think you'll see that in many of the other districts uh, that they've got. You're gonna see uh, procurement of hotspots. You're gonna see procurements of, uh, like there's gonna be training uh, that they did for their schools. You're gonna see extra janitorial work that was done. You'll see extra bus runs uh, to minimize and make sure that we had social distancing. So it really is kind of, this is what's eligible and this is the thing that you will see. So and the, and when we get to the second tranche, the new thing that I think we'll see is we're gonna see more emphasis on learning loss, more emphasis on air systems, that I'm not sure what'll end up in that other category, but we'll sit, wait and see. So will the um, will the grant amount in ESRA two follow the same um, process allocation as the uh, ESRA one? It will, and we've already given preliminary allocations, and then we're just finalizing those. Um, and, and part of the reason why it takes a little bit of time is we have some programming that we have to do, and um, and as you know, there, there's been some difficulty getting free and reduced information. This is a grant that allocates based on Title I formulas. And so we're just making sure that we get the best information possible to do the allocation. Thank you very much. Are there, I don't see anything else right now. Scroll up a little bit, Tammy. Yeah, yeah, excuse me, Mayor, uh, Representative Heath does have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Speaking of free and reduced lunch, Commissioner, um, in your budget, um, did you consider um, looking at the amounts? Oh, I believe that you have, um, but have you encouraged um, the legislative body to really look at um, allowing your department to use 2,000 
20 data versus the 21 data that will show those serious reductions that I think we have a couple of pieces of legislation. Um, I know that 263 does it and 263 does a couple of things. It, it keeps um, that difference and also the disparity. But um, do you have an input on that, please? Sure, I do. So I will tell you the number one thing that I am encouraging people to do is to go out and get these families signed up. Um, and the reason that I'm doing that is we have until June to be able to get those families signed up. So our initial census was low, but as we continue to bring students back into school, we've now got a, a you know a governor's directive that kids are in school at least two days a week, which means that those kiddos are going to be showing up. We're going to be touching them. We have until June to get that. So what I will tell you in the governor's budget, there is funding for free and reduced differentiated aid that has been built into there already. You know, I know that there's a number of legislative proposals out there, but that has already been built into that. But the number one thing we can do is try to get, uh, you know, the families to sign up because it's not, it, even if you as a state legislature can solve it at the state level, it could potentially affect some of my federal reporting as well. The federal may or may not have the same degree of latitude in terms of how they want to understand that. So our best solution is to make sure between now and June 30th, we sign up all the families that we can get signed up. And could I just to follow up then, thank you, Commissioner. I did not know. I thought it was going to be that one time October one count. You have that, the, the uh, federal DOE has given you that flexibility? So I've always had that flexibility, um, and but we just are continuing to emphasize it. It's just we've never run into a circumstance where the October count was so short and we're like, oh no, now what are we going to do, right? But we still have the ability. We've actually created a specific kind of mail flyer piece for the schools that kind of explains like, hey, it's not just free lunch. There's all these other programs that are tied to this to encourage them. And so again, particularly with students coming back into the building, I think that we have a, a good probability of you know, getting, identifying those families and getting them signed up. All right, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, okay, Commissioner, you, you have more money that you've given out. In what sense, I guess not, right? Um, okay, so governor's, so the GEAR funds or governor's emergency education funds, again, this is uh, funding that the governor has that's discretionary and it goes into the education, but it is more broadly available for broad response to, um, you know, the, uh, the coronavirus effect. Um, two of the areas, for example, where this has been directed so far has been for compensatory education for kids who have special needs, so IDEA students, um, and probably we'll end up with a little bit more of that, um, as well as focusing on student mental and behavioral health. And then the other one that I want to point out to you is the Ian's uh, seven million dollars. So that is um, emergency aid to non-public schools. When the thirty-seven million dollars was provided to us, it required what's referred to as equitable services, and that means that the local school districts provide support to the non-public schools in their district for students who need that support. These are Title I students who need that support. And uh, so what they did in the second tranche in the $156 million grant, they said the local school districts no longer have to provide uh, equitable services, but the state has to provide equitable services to the non-public schools. And they provided us $7 million to do that. The thing that's really odd here is when you do equitable services, I don't get to provide this as a grant. For the most part, I don't provide this as a grant to the non-public school. I have to actually procure the services for the non-public school. So that if the school needs Chromebooks, I have to go buy Chromebooks for them. I can't give them money to go buy Chromebooks. And so just to let, I only share that with you because that is a, um, administratively, that's something we're having to walk through because we're not necessarily set up to go procure $7 million worth of uh, services for all of our non-public schools in the state, but it is something we're working with Department of Administrative Services and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to execute that well. And then if you want to just scroll up one more time, Tammy. Uh, excuse me, uh, I think you didn't have enough challenges with uh, what was going on, so uh, the feds thought you could uh, handle something new. But <laughs> Representative Heath, you have a question. Just Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, to follow up on um, actually the chair's um, request. Can we get um, 
you're, you, I know that you have to do spreadsheets for each school district, for each pot of money. Could you um, 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 allow us to get, to get access to those as well, please? Sure, thanks. So you want the allocations, I can send those allocations out to you. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, Rep. Murray was also looking for that as well. So I'll, but she's gonna then, so here's the allocation and here's where that stands. So I'll make sure I send that out. So the next question, the U.S. Department of Agriculture provided us with an additional $47 million to support our food and nutrition in the state. Um, as you know, we're serving many more meals uh, throughout the state because we've opened up our eligibility and this just helps us continue to support that. And then lastly, through GOFER, uh, which is the Governor's Office for Emergency Relief and Recovery, uh, we provided in November supplemental grants to the schools for $45 million. That included a every school got $200 per student for $35 million. And then we had a $10 million pot where we had schools that had extraordinary you know, disruptions. They had some project that had to get done and they had no other funding sources. Um, and they applied for those grant funds and then we fully awarded those as well. So these, this is just a summary so far of the federal funds that have come into the school. If you go back up to the top, so the total of all these is about $305 million um, that we have made available to the districts to help with their response to COVID. Okay. Um, so this was all basically from the CARES Act that was passed a year ago. This it money. was a combination of the CARES Act that was passed a year ago, as well as um, from the uh, the relief, the CARIS, CARISA, uh, that was passed in December 28th is 156 million comes to us from that. And then a $48 million was just an appropriation from the US Department of Education, not a separate congressional act. Okay, so, um... We're not expecting any additional money then from the uh, December passage of that bill. So this is the money that it, from that bill that is directed to the school system. You know, I don't know what the funds are that will be directed to the state and how that will be distributed within the state. So I can't comment on that. We do anticipate um, if the current relief legislation is passed that's in Congress now, uh, that additional funds will be made available to the district. Okay. Uh, I would like to say that I contacted um, the superintendent of schools here in Conway, and they have tried every which way they could to get the parents to sign the children up for uh, the free and reduced lunch. And they are having like zero success in doing that. And so I, I know that, you know, Kevin said, I send text messages, I do phone calls, I send emails, I send the forms home with the kids. Uh, and we're just, not, we're just not making any progress in that area. And, uh, you know, I don't know what other school systems are doing, but I, I certainly believe in our SAU that they have tried everything possible to get the families to, uh, to sign up. And I, I know that, you know, everyone right now is eligible for lunch. And so it becomes a, uh, a really tough situation to change the um, to get to get the families to sign up. So I have, if you have some sort of a brilliant idea about what what the superintendents can do, uh, would you let us know? Because they have, in, at least in SAU nine, from uh, what he explained to me, I don't know what else he could do. I mean, so the only other strategy that I have continued to hear is, um, you know, going to where the meals are being distributed, because we still do have some meals that are being distributed to families doing pickups at centralized locations. So 
So when those parents come to pick up the meal, have them fill out the form for the meal, right? Um, another one is I have districts he's, that are he's going- done, He's done that too. <laughs> okay, good. And then I have districts that are going door to door. Um, I have I do have one LEA that has gotten all of them in, right? And they, But they literally had to go to the families and say, oh, we need you to fill this out. And then they were able to get them. But I, I will reiterate that in the current budget proposal, we do have the free and reduced differentiated aid um, built into that budget. So, you know, so as this thing evolves, we'll be able to see what that looks like. Okay, are there, uh, are there any further questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Heath. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just want to concur with, with our chair. This is a very, very difficult time for school districts and families. And any help that the Department of Ed can provide, um, it's just, I don't even know where to begin with all the issues that have come up. And my biggest worry are those children who have simply disappeared and nobody can reach them, nobody can find them. Um, so it's, it's a hard time and it certainly is a situation that we've had a lot of discussions in our children's caucus about. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, but I do have a couple of other questions. I, I didn't know, Madam Chair, are you wrapping up? Uh, or, no, if you have other questions, please. Well, uh, question, uh, yeah, I, just, I, I, excuse me just a second. I, Mickey, do I have education scheduled for Thursday of next week? I think that's the day. So um, we will have uh, uh, a deeper dive into uh, into what's going on there. So I uh, as so we'll we'll have some other things. But please, if you no, if you have questions, I'd like you to uh, please ask them at this time. All right. Thank you. I just have two quick ones. Um, one question, and I think I saw it in the budget, and I was very excited about seeing it and I'm hoping I'm correct in my assumption, is the National Teacher Accreditation Program. And I thought I saw $5,000 in each year of the biennium for that. Am I correct? Um, so I believe, I believe that's a membership. Okay. Um, and my second question is with regard to teacher credentialing. And my question to you is, how much funding do you have in reserve in that um, well, not in the budget itself, but in the department, how much money do you have in reserve? So I don't know the exact amount, but I do know that what we did is we just, this last year, we reduced our uh, renewal fees. So uh, essentially, because I saw there was some reserve that was developing, and so we're just going to return that back out to our credential holders by a reduced fee is what we're doing. Because I know you're self-funded through that, that yeah. program, that, that department. Um, but if you could, but, but just, yeah. I think it's important. Like, so the philosophy we have is like we should not be accumulating money there, right? The fees are supposed to pay for the credentials, and if we don't need that money, then we should return it to the credential holders. And so that's why we reduced that savings. Just one thought, though, um, with that those funds, one of the areas that um, is often lacking is professional development statewide for our teachers. And I often thought that that would be a wonderful source of funding for teachers and um, educate, uh, lead, educational leaders um, in terms of what the state could do. I mean, this goes back to my former role that the department never having enough money to do professional development. Just a thought. I thank you for answering my questions. Uh, Commissioner, is that a 125 situation? Which one? The credentialing. When you say 125, I'm not sure know what you mean. Oh. Well, it's uh, where you charge 125% of the cost. Um, so I don't know how they derive that fee. So we've had a fee for some amount of time and then I saw a balance accumulating. So we did some modeling and said, we can reduce the fee. I didn't want to go too drastic and then I end up in trouble, but we reduced the fee and are bleeding it back off. So I don't think it is based on a fixed percent of cost plus a percent plus a fee because the number of licenses that we renew varies every year. So it's really a function of just managing that balance in the educator fund. Uh, what I, I mean, I, I think Representative Heath might remember, maybe Representative Rumber, you do as well. I think a couple of years ago, you guys might have come in and swept some of that. And um, I think that that's the teacher's money and I think we're gonna get it back for the teachers, so. Uh, Tammy, you had a, uh, your hand raised. 
I just wanted to say that it is not a 125. Thank you, Kim. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Lynn. Yes, I wonder, Commissioner, if I could go back to the, the issue that uh, was raised by uh, 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 Representative Umberger uh, with regard to uh, difficulty in having parents sign up for the free and reduced. I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding is the if parents don't sign up for the free and reduced lunch program, does that mean that the kids don't get the free and reduced lunch or is it just or do they get it anyway? And it's just sort of a paperwork issue. Yeah, so this is what the problem is. So we receive waivers. So normally what we have to do is we have to qualify people to be able to receive free lunch. We've gotten waivers during the pandemic from the US Department of Agriculture that allows us to feed everybody, right? So whether you fill out a form or you're not, it's free food, right? And so what's happening, there's no motivation to fill out the paperwork because you're gonna get your food whether you fill out the paperwork or you don't fill out the paperwork. So many people are like, well, there's no reason to fill it out. I still get free lunch. And right. so that's what's driven it. <laughs> the difficulty is, is that while, while you're wo focusing really on the state solution relative to that, in terms of state adequacy and the effect on state funding, that free and reduced application is also the basis for many of my federal allocations. And so if those parents don't fill them out, you might solve the state problem, but I still may have a federal problem. So that's why I say my number one goal is like, let's get the application filled out as best we can. And can I just ask a follow-up uh, on that? Certainly. Yeah, um, so my other question is, is this, I wonder if part of the problem here or part of the issue here is um, some reluctance on the part of parents to, to kind of acknowledge that they, you know, that they are in need of the of the free and reduced lunch program, and, and so, so I guess my question is is, you know, as sort of as a practical matter, if I'm a student in one of these schools and I'm getting free and reduced lunch, does does everybody in the school know that? I mean, does the do the other kids know that? Is that uh, whether they're supposed to know it or not? I'm really sort of asking a practical question. Do do they in fact know it? So there are. Um mechanisms in place to make sure that that information from the system is not shared. It's quite possible that a student might do that, but a student walking through the lunch line, nobody's gonna know. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, maybe somebody could um, forward to us the uh, title programs that are allocated based on free and reduced lunch. And I think that that would help uh, Representative Lynn understand how important the free and reduced lunch counts are. And uh, so, it's, so what I'm uh, gonna do, I can send this over to you and this might be helpful. This is, I had mentioned the flyer, so I just like called this up. I can shrink it down a bit so you can see it better. Um, but this is more than a meal application. And then we go through all of, you know, it's the PEBT eligibility after school academic enrichment programs free and reduced meal 30 day rollover from the next year, state and federal funding and school budgets, fund computer technology in your home, fee waivers for college application, resources for classroom teachers. Like all of these things are affected if we don't get these applications. So this is a, a flyer that we created and shared with the schools and I'm happy to share with you to help understand why it's important and why we need to get this, you know, these applications done. So. Thank you. Uh, that would be great. Appreciate it very much. But you don't have the actual title programs identified there, do you? I can, no, I don't. I can go get the title program for you as well. Yeah, just you, you know, just handwrite it on there. You don't, uh, you know, we don't need you to prepare something different. Just so that we know that, uh, you know, what what pro what programs are. Uh, so the only the only caution I'll tell you is that you know as, as we're having a conversation at the state level, the feds are having conversation as well about the effect of this because it's not unique to New Hampshire. And so while I can describe those, we may or may not get some kind of relief at the federal level, right? We don't know if they provide some kind of a waiver. They say use last year's counts or, you know, and there have been circumstances where they've given us flexibility in terms of the counts that we use, so. It makes it very difficult for, um, yeah, for the for those for the dollars that come in for the federal program 
for the schools to budget and to, mm -hmm. you know, to know, but obviously they will never turn down money that's sent in the future. So, you know, hopefully we can get all of this worked out. Are there any other questions of the commissioner at this point? Representative Heath? I apologize, Madam Chair. Just you don't quickly. you don't have to apologize. This is your opportunity. So please. We haven't talked much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you for taking my question. We haven't talked much about the scholarship programs. Um, when we, I don't want you to do it now, but when we meet again, would you please just review? the steps and the differences and what we're doing now with all of the different scholarships, how they're working, to whom they'll go, who gets what and who doesn't get what they use are used to getting. Um, I would deeply appreciate that because I've been trying to look at the draft of HB2 and looking at the budget. I just can't decipher all of that. And it would be helpful if you could walk me through that next week. So, so I'm happy to do that, except I want to be careful. So the Office of Strategic Planning is the one who's administered most of the governor's scholarship programs or through the university system directly. So it might be more appropriate for them to explain those scholarship programs because those are not administered through the department. All right, thank you. Yeah, they, there's um, there are some changes that are being made to the... Uh, to the scholarship programs and uh, well, uh, yes, Mary, somehow or other, I know, I just know that Mickey will be able to find the right person to come and talk to us about that. He always does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Representative, you're on mute. Representative. Oh. Representative Umberger, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this newfangled technology. But I wanted to thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, talking to us today. And I know that myself, as well as the entire committee, appreciate your uh, what you're doing. And uh, I know that our... Uh, We'll be uh, taking this deep dive into the budget and trying to come to grips with uh, what we need to do and uh, we'll see what happens. So, and anyhow. We recess representative, I think your tentative schedule had DOE on for Friday of next week, not Thursday. So I don't know if you wanna confirm that with them while we have them. Yeah, I'm sorry, let me look at, can I, I'll be right back, okay? Yes, I'm sorry, it is next Friday at 10. We've got transportation on Wednesday, uh, safety on Thursday, and DOE on Friday. Tammy, you have a comment or question? Yes, just um, we have a capital bu budget presentation at 1015 on Friday. Okay. Um, can we make it one o'clock? That, you know, my only, uh, this is Bob Lynn, my only uh, concern is I have, I have to be in Londonderry at noon to get my first vaccine shot. And uh, so I'll be there, I'll be back as soon as possible, but I'm not missing that. <laughs> Caitlin, you have your hand raised. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, I was just gonna say Friday morning, I don't believe I need to be at capital budget. So we could do school aid, like adequacy and building aid in the morning if you wanted to use that time. And then the commissioner and Tammy can do the capital budget presentation. 
if that works for the committee. That's fine with me. If that's agreeable with the commissioner, I'm sure it is. Okay, uh, Representative Murray, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, are, are, the, are we starting at 10 o'clock on those mornings, those days? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, I've got a bill at nine o'clock on Wednesday, so I should be totally fine to be here at 10. This is a great thing with Zoom. I don't have to move. I can just flip from one meeting to the next. <laughs> this is fabulous. Yeah, we can, we can set up three computers in our office. <laughs> Or, I'm sorry, in my dining room. <laughs> yeah. well, some of us have done simultaneous meetings on occasion. This is, wow. The, the other Almost issue, like quantum mechanics being in two places at one time. The other issue representative uh, we may have on uh, Wednesday with DOT is I believe governor and council is meeting in the morning. So they had a little bit of a concern with a conflict there. So I don't know if we can maybe work something with them that they could provide some somebody to meet with us in the morning, or if you did want to just push them to the afternoon. So we may have to work on that. Okay, well, I need to get that to Janet. Um, well, wh why don't we just make it one o'clock on th DOT, right? Yeah. On Thursday, I can change that. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Next week, I can't even think about tomorrow and uh, uh, yeah. Wednesday. So I will, uh, I'll change that with Janet. And should, we, should we plan for the whole day? 10, two, 2, 3, 4, should we plan for the whole day? Uh, probably two and a half hours. Okay. So it, it really depends on um, what kind of uh, questions, you know, you have with the, uh, with the various agencies. And we're looking also on Monday, uh, we're calling that uh, HB1, HB2 work session. Uh, so uh, Mickey will be going through all of the areas that affect us in uh, HB2. And hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll have the, uh, the bill uh, before then, but uh, if not, we'll still go through it and make up our own HB2 as to what uh, what we would what we would really like to see in HB2 as opposed to what might be there. So, is that work for you, uh, Mickey? It does, and um, and we can talk about whether you want to schedule all of these work sessions to be somewhat generically titled, so we could. Um, fill some space with, you know, for instance, if DOE is available Wednesday morning, whereas DOT is not, you know, maybe we have them talk about an issue or two to use that time. It's up to you. We can talk about that later as well. Yeah, uh, I, uh, okay. You and I will have a conversation, uh, but anyhow, just, just know that next week it's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And it's March. I know. I can't believe it. St. Patrick's Day is coming up. So <laughs> we'll, and, and spring. We'll do on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, I guess I shouldn't say that. I was going to have some green beer for everybody. but uh, <laughs> as long not as a, it's in a coffee cup, nobody will know. <laughs> OK, that's true. <laughs> now, Commissioner, don't you be talking about no, what no, we're <laughs> You do whatever you want to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> one one thing about Division Two, as you know, is that we always have a good time, and that's uh, and that's what I that's one of the reasons I like our division so much. So, okay, if there's nothing else, we will uh, close down, and I will see all of you tomorrow at uh, right. at session, which ought to be yeah. In person. Yeah. In person, yes. In real life, yeah. First time I've been out of my house in a long time, except <laughs> for when I went to get my shot. I'll have a chance to get caught up on wait, wait, don't tell me in the car. So. <laughs> That's true. I think I'm in, I think I'm still in January. So. Okay, so um, thank you all for being here and all of your uh, great questions that you asked today. And, um, 
We'll see you on Friday when we will be talking with the uh, university system and the community college. And that starts at 1030 because uh, uh, chancellor for the community college had something going on at nine. And so we wanted to make sure that we gave her the appropriate time to get herself transitioned from whatever she was doing to our meeting. So if there's nothing else, we'll recess this meeting and I'll see you on Friday. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oops. Bye. -bye. Oops, bye.